Um, so welcome everybody to uh, today's session at the Tony Blair Institute um, on uh, technology policy uh, trends and reasons to be optimistic uh, about the future. My name is Chris Yu. I am the Institute's Executive Director for Technology and Public Policy. Um, and my team uh, spends time working with uh, leaders and policymakers around the world um, on issues to do with the tech revolution um, and how leaders master the implications, uh, access the opportunities and mitigate the risks of new technologies. Um, we are going to spend some time uh, today with uh, a couple of guests just talking through uh, some of the things that have happened uh, in the world recently, um, particularly in relation to technology and how COVID-19 has accelerated uh, many of those developments. Um, and we are going to open this up to Q&A uh, with everybody uh, in the audience today. Um, so there is a Q&A box on Zoom that you can click and pop in uh, questions that you'd like to ask the panel. Feel free to uh, get cracking on that um, as we go through the discussion and then we will bring some of your views and questions and perspectives into the conversation uh, later on. The other point on housekeeping is that we are going to be running some interactive polling as we go in this session. Uh, for those of you who've done the polls on Zoom before, um, it should be pretty straightforward. For those who haven't, um, when we get to those points, um, a pop-up will appear giving you some options to pick from. Um, and if you can just uh, do that, then I think the poll should disappear and we'll share the results uh, as we go through the, go through the uh, discussion. Um, and thank you to those of you who've sent in uh, questions ahead of time. We will make sure we pick some of those up uh, as well. So what I will do first is just introduce um, our panelists for today. I am super excited to uh, be embarking on this conversation uh, with them. We have got two fantastic uh, guests with us. Um, Carly Kind is here. Carly is director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is an independent research and deliberative body with a mission to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. Uh, Carly is a human rights lawyer and leading authority on the intersection of tech policy and human rights. She's advised industry, government and nonprofits on digital rights, privacy and data protection and corporate accountability. And previously worked with the European Commission, uh, the Council of Europe, numerous UN bodies and a range of civil society organizations, prior to which she was legal director of Privacy International, which many of you will know is an NGO dedicated to promoting data rights and governance. So Carly, uh, welcome, fantastic to have you with us. Uh, and our second panelist is uh, Arik Chowdhury. Uh, Arik recently uh, joined the Royal Society as a senior policy advisor focusing on data and digital technologies. He's also the founder of Webroots Democracy, a tech policy think tank which ran between 2014 and 2020, and has authored various reports on electronic voting, digital health, uh, online abuse, and facial recognition. Um, many of you will uh, know that he led a high profile project on synthetic media during the 2019 general election, uh, producing viral deep fakes of Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn endorsing each other for prime minister. Um, and his background also includes working at the Foreign Office, uh, Department for Culture, Media and Sports, uh, UK Parliament and KPMG. Um, so uh, two phenomenal uh, guests to have with us. We are gonna treat this um, conversation between the three of us very much like um, a conversation and a discussion. Um, we've got a few topics that we'll make our way through. Um, and as we go, we will, um, uh, as I say, do the polls and then be looking out for your uh, Q&A. So um, Tom, who is running the polls, if you can pop the first one up in the background while we get started. Um, the first question for um, participants and attendees uh, is about uh, technology and just to get your take uh, in a nutshell of whether tech was a force for good uh, in the world in 2020. So um, give us your views on that while we get started. Um, Carly, maybe we can start with you. Um, just reflecting on the year that's gone by and uh, everything that has happened uh, in terms of the pandemic and the way that it's accelerated the use of technology in our lives. Um, what have you taken away in terms of um, both, you know, your highlights um, in terms of things which maybe went better than expected? And what's your take on overall progress? Like, I feel like we've moved forward, but maybe it's not uh, evenly distributed. Mm. 
Good question. Thanks, Chris, and thank you again for having me. Um, yes, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because without a doubt, um, we were better prepared for this pandemic than we've ever previously been, in particular in terms of the digital tools available to us. Um, to do the very unique thing required of us during this pandemic, which was to stay home. So the availability of free and easy to use collaborative working tools, communications tools, um, food delivery tools, etc., really did um, make our lives easier this year. And that kind of convenience element of tech is not to be sneered at, and it is both a you know, social force and an economic force. Um, but I think to oversimplify the story in, as that alone is both to fail to recognise the deep problems with tech and the tech policy landscape, and also to look at it only from the perspective, the particular perspective of white collar knowledge workers who most easily were able to make that transition and benefit from those technologies. And of course, one thing we know about this pandemic is that it has had the most disparate of impacts on deprived communities, on people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, also the same people who are less likely to work in white collar and knowledge industries. So, um, you know, it's very easy for us policy wonk types to sit around and say, how great was tech this year? We were able to Zoom everybody and get Deliveroo. Um, but of course, it's not been the case for everybody. So, you know, putting aside that question of the deep kind of structural inequalities, I still think that there are reasons to be both kind of optimistic about why tech helped with addressing the crisis and you know I'm sure we'll talk at some stage about vaccine production which undeniably has been aided through tech and is a huge success story um, but I think in terms of sustainability and what we've learned about the tech landscape I think this year has also worsened uh, problems around the concentration of power and the in particular the concentration of wealth um, and we've seen some people get a lot more richer and some companies get a lot more um, valuable um, in a in a, dire a direction travel that we were already heading in and I think that that's actually gotten worse and I think what has really come to light during this pandemic is how digital infrastructure is controlled or privatized um, and and what we've learned during the past year is that, in fact, the digital infrastructure on which we rely is a public utility that we all need to use even more than we use roads and transport networks at, at this stage in our lives. And yet it is controlled by private companies. And so that kind of privatization of the digital sphere, I think, has really been brought into sharp relief this year. And that doesn't feel like it's gotten better. It feels like it's gotten worse. Um, and so I know you wanted to start with an optimistic note, and I'm sorry for taking it in a pessimistic direction. But um, I think throughout 2020, that has emerged as a really urgent tech policy issue, which is what does a fair and inclusive digital public infrastructure look like? What do fair and inclusive digital markets look like? In And how do we reimagine that post-crisis? Yeah, yeah. And I think... Um... Like I, I, a lot of that resonates with me and it feels often like um, you know, many of the trends that you know we saw coming 18 months ago have been accelerated and as you say both mm -hmm. the upsides for many aspects of how we live our lives and manage to like sustain some things in the course of a global public health emergency that mm -hmm. wouldn't have been possible five or ten years ago but they've also forced right to the fore a lot of these difficult questions that we maybe thought we had five years to get our heads around and actually we've got to deal with them now and you know had we been having this conversation um you know six or seven months ago we would have been talking about contact tracing apps and whether apple and google have got the right to exercise so much power over a decision which feels like it ought to be in the domain of politics and government health policy and i don't propose that we do a 15 minutes digression into contact tracing apps yeah. now but I think it's a good illustration of that point that actually power yeah. has become concentrated and we haven't quite figured out the mechanisms that we need to navigate that new that new settlement. Um, Arik, what's your what's your take on on this in terms of the way we've started to adopt many of these technologies and platforms and whether what we have now is sustainable? Yeah, um, so I'm going to bring back some of the optimism, although yeah. I do agree with everything Kylie just said. I do think 2020 was the year of technology. And the reason I say that is all we have to imagine is what the pandemic would be like without uh, the internet and we'd, we'd all be lonelier 
um, you know, less joy and less spirit, and ultimately more people would have died. And I think that I would love someone to do that kind of research, right, to see how many, if if it's possible to calculate it, how many lives are saved as a result of bringing things online, you know, doing things like Deliveroo, um, having that kind of social connection between families who can't see each other. Um, but I also think it was a force for good in, in every other year beforehand as well. Even, you know, 2016, I would say it was a force for good. And that's because, you know, we still have those great promises of technology around, uh, you know, knowledge, connection, democracy. Again, in 2020, we saw the, the um, Black Lives Matter protests, again, organized primarily through the internet. Uh, as we saw in you know, similar movements in previous years. What I think this year has shown is a failure on two fronts. So the first is our failure to recognize the, the social good of technology and internet access prior to the pandemic. And you're seeing that now where we can't do things like remote learning because of the, the kind of impact it has. People who don't have access to the internet, um, even government policy. I used to work on um, broadband when I was at DCMS and policy then, at least at that point, was focused just on infrastructure and in particular rural areas, not really so much on demand and take up. And I think that's changed now in 2020. I think we're starting to, to realise that a bit more. Um, and also we failed again on the point that Carly is making around the, the sort of power of the big tech, tech companies and the way we've really not um, not managed to grapple with the kind of infrastructure power of the tech companies. And a very recent example that I think is quite alarming is the um, takedown of Trump's accounts and similar uh, platforms like Parler, for example. So whilst obviously I don't like Parler personally or Donald Trump, I think the ability of, um, you know, two major companies in Silicon Valley to take those decisions, I think is quite alarming. You mentioned the contact tracing example. That's another uh, alarming example, I'd say, of the, the power of big tech. Um, so I think that's, for me, the, the two key themes is, is just our total failure to exploit those benefits of technology that we should have really known before the pandemic. But then it's also really highlighted the kind of infrastructure power of technology and moved them, I think, from being just services to being more like our, our telephone network or, um, you know, the water network, right? It's kind of it. Yeah. That is yeah. Seen, I think in that category, and I think that's kind of what my big takeaway from, from the year has been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's really, really, um, really on point. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time on in our work at the Institute is this notion of, um, you know, what does 21st century infrastructure but what does that mean? And you know, is it the case that actually, not just broadband, right, but data and software and the networks and the platforms that we use, like that's a more meaningful conversation about infrastructure in the year 2021 than like, roads and railways still matter, right? Like, don't get me wrong, but um, if you think that you can, you know, focus on that and treat what's happening in the digital realm as a sort of afterthought, then you're grossly mistaken about what's actually happening. Uh, out there. Can we come back just to that point about um, you made around, um, uh, you know, like the, the benefits and how the technology has helped to get us through, right? So like I, like probably uh, many people on the call have had uh, homeschool set up in a spare room with kids doing lessons on uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and you know, I've managed to see my GP over a video consultation, which um, has been technically possible for what, well, like, more than ten years, but possible only in a policy sense in the last nine months because, for whatever reason, we were told that couldn't be done. Um, it feels to me like lots of that. You know, we'd rather we weren't doing this, but it's actually been remarkably, after a bumpy start, remarkably positive actually. Um, what are your, like, for you, what stands out in terms of things which actually um, were stuck before but have been unlocked, like particularly in the kind of government and public services space? Like who's got this really right and surprised you? Um, 
I don't know, but just from from personal experience, I think what example you reminded me of was my my mum started a course actually an adult learning course, um, which moved completely um, online, and seeing her move, someone who doesn't really use the internet that much, or she uses the internet but doesn't really use um, you know laptops and stuff that much, right? Seeing her move on to the internet becoming more digital that literate. I think it's been quite an interesting um, phenomenon for me <laughs> personally. And I think perhaps if you can keep some of that kind of remote learning for adult education, you can finally start to realize some of those prior policy conversations we have about upskilling people and maybe make it seem a bit more realistic and a bit more practical. Um, yeah. I don't know who's really got this right. I, I think, you know, like, Carly's minute, it is still important to remember that it is still certain groups in society who have benefited, people who are sitting at their desk and one office and others sitting at their desk at home, right? Generally, that's the yeah, yeah, yeah. More general picture. And even with the schooling um, example, we still have not just the challenges of access to, yeah. to devices. Um, you know, what I think we've seen is, is a clash between the reality of people's lives and technology and how it's not just about access to devices so that one phrase I saw recently was the phrase digital poverty yeah yeah it's it's a phrase which shouldn't really we shouldn't really be talking about as we shouldn't use that phrase because same with food poverty right there is there is poverty generally right and that's the issue we should be addressing you address issues like um housing incomes uh, education and then you address all the follow-on I think we've um seeing this become as a, as a novel form of uh poverty right which i think is a mistake um but but those, those are the sorts of issues you have to avoid that and again that i think has come up as a kind of ongoing problem which hasn't really been addressed yet and if we just simply go back to the new normal without addressing those i don't think we've really learned a lesson so much with the pandemic yeah i i also wonder i mean i think it's it's undeniably true that um it's been wonderful. I also have a child and being able to have a video call with a GP is, has been incredible actually during this period of time. I do wonder for the most part how much we actually will very much revert to normal when we have the opportunity. I, I think if most people, if they could choose between a video call and a face to face with their GP would choose the latter. And I, I also don't think we understand the very long term effects of remote um, GP consultations, but also remote remote learning for children. I think probably research will ultimately show that they don't get a range of different um, benefits that they might otherwise get. So I think it's been it's made this whole year more survivable. Whether or not it signals long term changes in terms of how we how we interact with various public services, I'm a little dubious of. It certainly has changed the nature of work in a way that I think we'd be remiss to not try to keep some of the changes I think the idea that we would all move back to um, a nine-to-five work day in, in an office that involves lengthy commuting and um, other disadvantages I think you know let's hope that some of that has been relinquished but again my sense is at least from the people I talk to that people are really keen to get back into seeing their colleagues again and um, being back in a workplace perhaps a, a slightly happier medium than we had before and I think just from again from a kind of quite a narrow world view that I in in the work that I do there has certainly been a lowering of a threshold in terms of access to different people and different conversations I find it much easier to have meetings with policymakers or people in industry that than previously because the barrier to entry for a Zoom call is much lower than um, that for a face-to-face -face meeting and there we might see some really interesting implications for um, kind of geographical spread uh, certainly in the UK which is incredibly centralised around London and seeing more investment in regional working because that has been made possible and let's hope that that ties in or at least kind of brings an additional incentive around this idea of digital leveling up if we see more people move to other regions outside of London there's a higher reason you know a, a, a more incentives to invest in digital infrastructure including in broadband which is so critical to that idea of digital leveling up yeah yeah I particularly like that point around like say access to um you know policymakers and those broader 
conversations and opening up government. I mean, it's maybe baby steps, but speaking as someone who uh, once upon a time was a civil servant and remembers how allergic, you know, many of our, you know, bureaucracies were to notions of anything other than a face-to-face -face meeting in a boardroom. Um, it's been nice to kind of see things pulled to a place where um, people have been forced to be a bit more open and, and flexible. Um, but as you guys say, not without um, some challenges as well. Um, the results of our first poll are in. We asked people, was tech a force for good in the world in 2020? Um, and there we are overwhelmingly, um, people have said yes, but I suspect um, that actually, you know, that's quite a, a blunt question we've asked and, you know, lots of the nuance that we've just been describing, I think people will um, identify with. Um, what I think we should do is, Tom, if you pop our second poll up for us, we want to ask folk who are here um, about um, where you think responsibility for, you know, keeping this momentum going uh, lies. I mean, the truth is it's going to be a bundle of these, but we're interested in people's sense of, of uh, you know, some of the different options that we've shown. Um, while folk are doing that, why don't we just move on and talk a little bit about, um, you know, what comes next, right, in 2021 and uh, beyond. Um, the Institute recently published um, a collection of perspectives from leading thinkers in uh, tech and innovation and entrepreneurship around um, uh, their moonshots, if you like, for the period ahead and the things that humanity could potentially solve with technology. And that spanned everything from sustainable food and clean energy to real progress on things like um, uh, global uh, health and other forms of uh, infrastructure. Um, what do both of you think in terms of, you know, you look back on, on where we are and what's to come, what, what inspires you and makes you optimistic in terms of technology and where the world is going. Um, Carly, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I think absolutely the vaccine production, vaccine research and vaccine production has been remarkable over the past year and we should take so much heart and hopefully inspiration from that as a as a you know a, an achievement of science but also achievement of technology i think what that has shown is um that in times of crisis old barriers can be very quickly brought down so in this case kind of um concerns around propriety tree research like you know inability to work in the open cross-cultural barriers to sharing research etc um and proprietary approaches by companies all of which kind of dissipated overnight and 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 there was a huge coming together um and that that has resulted in incredible advancements we we must take so much hope from that about how in the next crisis which we focus focus on which will i hope be the climate crisis um, that type of collaborative working and um, willingness to consider entirely new situations and, and new approaches can really deliver results in a very short period of time. So in the case of vaccines, delivering in a year what may have taken a decade, imagine what we can achieve around net zero and climate if only we had the same sense of urgency and the same willingness to bring down barriers. So I think that's that gives me immense hope. I think what we saw in with 2020 is a reminder that things can radically change overnight. In the case of the pandemic, overnight, the whole world ground to a halt in a way we just could not have foreseen in January 2020. And I think there's there's some who've argued, and I think there's real truth to it, that that's the reason we saw, for example, Black Lives Matter really take hold and the momentum really build last year because people were reminded that the, we do not have to accept the way things are now forever, that the world can change. So, you know, let's take that you know inspiration and hope and 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 take it through to addressing the climate crisis because that is the next biggest crisis we face and it is much bigger than this pandemic that we've just survived well yeah that some of us have just survived yeah 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 and i mean i think the um vaccines are such a great example and um you know particularly the fact that some of the new technologies around those I mean, the, the virus was sequenced by January of last mm. year, and it was a matter of days before the first messenger RNA vaccines were mm. designed, right? So, yeah. um, but yeah. compared to, they can say, years or decades previously, and yeah, maybe there's still scope for improvement on, um, you know, the clinical trials and getting these things to market. But what it does show is that, you know, humanity has reached the point where we have 
tremendous power when we work together for the greater good um, yeah so really heartening the, the other thing I would just say Chris and sorry if it takes us slightly off your question but the yeah. other thing that I conclude about the vaccine production is that the change can come from the private sector it can come from industry it can come from innovators but it can never come without governments uh investing in it and supporting it and so in the case of vaccine production we saw not only state investment going heavily into supporting the vaccine efforts in a really critical way but also verifying the vaccine was a role that only states could play and you know we, we are still yet I think to really push the boundaries of what public trust in vaccines actually means and you know at the moment we're still in this very much honeymoon period with the vaccines that everybody who gets invited goes along and gets it but you know once we reach 50 60 percent of the population history shows that we might actually start to tail off in how many people actually trust in getting a vaccine so in the uk's context having mhar mhra um approval of that vaccine was so critical um to, to building public trust in it and that for me says if we transport that into other you know innovate innovation challenges you need not only the innovators and private sector there to spur and to to create uh, innovation but you do need a trusted government to invest in it and to to validate it and to oversee it yeah absolutely and i think um like building a little bit further on that before we get to arik i think there's something in here that like when i think about many of these questions i often feel that some of the hardest parts are presented as questions of purely questions of science or technology when they're also questions of leadership and policy and so some decisions that you need to make around you know what is the balance of risk you know at what point do i you know cease trials and move to um you know roll out or you know how do i make some of these decisions mm. don't have straightforward answers mm. Similarly, around you know, the way that people would react to um, uh, you know drives to get vaccinated depends in part on the technology. Depends in part, as you say, on do we trust the people who are giving us these messages? And um, you know that requires everybody to step up a little bit. Mm, Arik, um, how about you? In terms of um, where should we find um, inspiration, and um, you know what's the kind of innovation that excites you about? The period ahead. I don't, know about, I don't know about innovation, but something that I think we should um, think about is the change in administration in the US to Joe Biden. I think that'll have a big, big effect of bringing the US back into the sort of global stage. But also, with regards to tech, I think we can start to a see a conversation around tech regulation, which is something I've been kind of quite desperate for for many years but also I think um, around some of the, the negative aspects of technology which a lot of people see is around disinformation I think with um, Donald Trump if you see him as a kind of central node of disinformation since 2016 with that being removed and do you then see the problem sort of dissip dissipate or do you see it sort of fragments and kind of go more underground does that give you more challenges in terms of regulation? Does it make the problem better? Um, I think that's going to be quite a significant shift that could have a, a big impact on, on, our, on our policy area. Um, I, yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm focusing on in particular, I think. Again, I mentioned it before, the sort of parlor thing. Yeah. Um, I think what we need to see in 2021 is this conversation more around like classical policy levers. So taxation of big tech platforms, uh, that's going to be back on the agenda now, I think under Joe Biden, um, whereas Trump had kind of seen it as part of a trade war. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also um, competition within, amongst the big tech platforms as well, that needs to be looked at. Whereas I think prior to this, we've kind of focused on very micro policies, content moderation, um, you know, one-off fines, those sorts of things, which I don't think are necessarily going to solve some of the, the deeper issues. Yeah. But how how far do you think, um, or how, how far do you agree with, like, the assessment of this situation, which is to say, like, clearly we've got to make significant progress on how we regulate 
large technology companies. Like often in the past, that has been something which is highly, it's often been highly confrontational and ended up actually then running into the sand or risking doing more harm than good. Um, like my hope is that having seen how integral um, many of these companies and their products have been to keeping things moving um, and having maybe realized that, um, uh, you know, all of us rely on things in a way that it's more than just tangential to our lives, but it's central to our lives. Policymakers are on for a different and more sophisticated and hopefully more practical discussion that sees this less technology less as a problem to be solved and more as something which if you regulate it right, it's good for everybody, right? It should be good for the companies, good for all of us as citizens and get to better policy outcomes. Maybe I'm just a hopeless optimist, but I like to think that what we've lived through and everything that we've seen ought to like ratchet up the pressure on government to be more only, sophisticated on this. Only I think if that if that regulation debate includes tax and competition as well, at the heart of it, which I, I still don't really think it has, at least not in this country. Um, so take you know, so one area I've looked at before is online abuse and combating that issue. Yeah. And ultimately you, you know, you can regulate these platforms so that they share data with researchers, for example. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily going to get rid of the problem. Um, or you could do things like takedowns of content. Again, that's not going to get to the heart of the problem. The heart of that problem is, is offline in, in wider society. One way you can tackle that is through a fix and taxation of those platforms. Again, another problem is the infrastructure issue we already spoke about. Um, that entirety of half of our mobile phone, net, all of our mobile phones networks owned by two companies, so you can be Google and Apple, right? That is an, is an issue as well. Same with some of the, the services we have online, dominate the three or four yeah. players. How do we make that more competitive? And only through those two core avenues can I, do I think we'll see any meaningful change. Um, although I do think we're very gradually going in that direction. I think too much of the focus has still been on like, the intricacies of a, a particular platform like Facebook or a particular platform like Twitter. I'm not looking at the sort of wider wider system and looking at how we've regulated things in the past and looking at how we've managed societies in the past, which has been through tax and competition policies, not content moderation and, uh, you know, data for, for Yeah, yeah, like absolutely. I often think that um, like one of the challenges for like this tech policy conversation is that like you have two things happening at once, which make it really difficult, right? One is that like in the traditional like institutions and bureaucracies of government, most of the mental models are still anchored in a world of bricks and mortar and different business models. And then the other one is explosion in access means that every decision maker has also got like Facebook and YouTube on their phone and experiences it, you know, for good and bad as a customer. And then, but then like knitting that into a coherent policy view is kind of hard because it's more like, well, my personal experience plus my outdated mental models give me an answer, which is probably a long way off where things are. Um, we've got the results of our second poll in. Tom, you can throw them up for everybody to have a look at. Um, so it looks to me like a kind of interesting distribution, but um, folk uh, attending. Um, saying so a third of people saying that um, our governments bear most of the responsibility for ensuring technology is a force for good in the world, but a quarter saying it's on the tech companies. And I think that probably reflects some of the conversation we've just been having about where does power uh, rest in, in this whole arena. Um, any surprise? Chris, can, yeah, Carly, sorry, I just, I just yeah. wanted to um, just come in on that conversation on yeah. tech regulation. I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe put a slightly finer point on it, which is I think, you know, I, I, I take what you're saying, which is how do we both regulate big tech and preserve the immense benefits we get from them? Um, and I think our conversation has been um, our, com our kind of societal conversation, I think, for a few years has been dominated by an exceptionalist um, debate around the world's duopoly, essentially Google and Facebook. So much of our, um, the way we've come at this issue is how do we deal with these two platforms? And I think what we're seeing is a shift to, um, uh, to 
solutions that aren't necessarily just about those two platforms because the problems that they experience are now replicated in other platforms. So yeah, there yeah. are now enough platforms that we can diagnose a problem with platforms. And that problem is broadly speaking around vertical integration and vertical monopolies. And so there is a way to regulate, which is about um, divvying up the, the, the kind of control at, at a horizontal level, I suppose, um, that doesn't necessarily have to signal the death of any platform, but is about decoupling um, uh, multiple businesses which exist under one and which create perverse incentives for companies to do certain things and which ultimately create this problem around platform power. So I, I actually think um, there is a very interesting conversation happening in the UK, particularly amongst regulators, whether or not that's trickled into government and and is going to emerge in a in a parliamentary statutory um, form anytime soon, I'm not sure, but there are there is very advanced conversations amongst a number of regulators about how to come at this issue. The European Union is going to fly on this this year and the state's attorney generals in the US are going to run at this as well. And I think we're going to see very real kind of antitrust um, regulation of the big tech companies. Now, actually I was, I can't claim this point as my own, but I was listening to Azim Azar's podcast yesterday at, and he interviewed Cory Doctorow, who's excellent on all of this. And Cory was making the point that with previous antitrust cases around IBM and Microsoft in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, what happened was the the leg the re the sorry the litigation took 10 years. And so by the time litigation ends, business models have changed, companies have changed yeah. anyway. So the very fact of instituting competition regulation, uh, sorry, competition litigation, will start to change the way platforms develop their business models. So I think that we are going to see a big shift in that. And the other thing to say is, I think some of the issues that Arik pointed to around content moderation and online abuse, for me, some of that relates back to the way that data, the data economy is, is incentivizes the collection of personal data to um, enable engagement to, to increase clicks on uh, viewing to support the ad based internet business model. And so there is again a structural kind of cure that is needed for that system that is not about going after any one company, but about addressing the underlying problems which lead us to these types of things. So I suppose at a, I've just gone into way too much detail, but I suppose at, at a high level, my point is um, there is a, um, a kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? company agnostic approach to improving the digital ecosystem that's not about trying to get rid of any one uh, platform on which we rely so heavily now but about trying to build a better structural system I suppose. Yeah I think that's a great way to think about it and I think your point is spot on around like the sophistication of the conversation amongst the regulators is improving and if that can then push into our elected officials and the government mm. policy making machine and a kind of broader um, capability I think to handle the sorts of questions that technology and the digital economy throws up mm. so much the better um you know one thing that's often struck us in our work is that like traditional government policy making still to a large extent happens through your like the silos that we've had for decades and I think if you step back far enough what you realize is from a policy perspective the challenge is caused by Google and Facebook, but also Spotify and Uber and Netflix and whatever else mm. have an awful lot in common and mm. probably more in common between these industries that you think are unrelated than Netflix does to regular, you know, media policy or whatever mm. else has that mm. as well, right? Yeah. There's this different dimension which we haven't had to deal with before. Yeah, um, that's right. Okay, I just want to, um, we'll pop our last poll up, Tom, just to get a quick, um, give people a quick fire chance to give us their uh, predictions on whether in nine years time, the world's largest tech company will be American, Chinese, my money is not on the European option here, but if anybody wants to surprise us, then um, someone vote for Europe. Um, and um, why don't we also just take a few of the uh, Q&A that have come in from uh, folk listening to this conversation we've had uh, a lot of these, so I apologise in advance, we're not going to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to take a selection and um, uh, give you some perspective on them. So um, one which I think Martin um, Yule asked us is, bear with me while I scroll this list, Zoom can do with some UI improvements. Uh, 
But I think it's interesting. Like, is the um, Martin asked, where's the bottleneck? Is it at innovating or in implementing? Which I guess you could take across many of the different things that we've discussed there. But um, I'd be interested in in your views. Um, maybe a week first. Um, more innovation in the world, or just more hustle to apply what we know. Um, it's a very, it's a very big and gorgeous question, but you need both, obviously, right? You need um, lots and lots of innovation. That innovation is what's got us through this pandemic at the end of the day. Um, in terms of lowering the barriers to to that, it's the same sort of issues, right? If if, if only I don't know, certain communities can can afford to create a startup, for example, are you going to get the best of innovation? If, um, you know, more people are supplied to, to uh, you know, give up, give access to more capital for, to a greater breadth of society, you might see greater innovation. Implementation, yeah, again, like, it depends, A, it depends on what it is, right? Um, I think innovation, if I was to pick out the two, I'd say innovation is, is key, right? And then implementation, I think, will come. And those which, those innovations which rise to the top will ultimately get implemented and any kind of bureaucracy will be, you know, overcome, really. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just noticed another question in the chat, which I, whereas I didn't explain properly before, the role of um, technology in Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. uh, was basically the, the, the filming of George Floyd's death, is what I was, I was referring to being on the smartphone and being spun on social media. That kind of accountability is where I thought um, technology and, and Black Lives Matter and 2020 is quite difficult. Sorry, I didn't explain that earlier before. No, no, that's, um, that's good. Thank you for picking that one, picking that one up. Um, Jonah asked a question which um, uh, touched on this debate about um, uh, big tech companies. And you know, we saw last year a lot of the CEOs being um, questions uh, in Congress and in the Senate. Um, I wonder if, Carly, you want to just um, share your thoughts on Jonah's question at the end. Will big tech, do you think, ever pay us for using our data? And could this help with any of the uh, human rights or other issues that um, seem to be in this space? It's a good question. I mean, I saw a few other questions there about um, kind of data commons and data trusts and other different mechanisms of um, empowering individuals around the data economy. I, I think absolutely there is um, there are proposals on the table for monetization of personal data in a, I mean, let's be clear, data, personal data is already monetized, but it's monetized by platforms rather than monetized by individuals. And um, some people offer individual monetization as a way to empower individuals uh, more with respect to their personal data. Personally and, and institutionally, the Lovelace Institute doesn't uh, prefer or endorse that approach primarily because at the end of the day personal data is life experience who we are as individuals and the idea that you would monetize that 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 is something that can be sold and purchased is I think uh goes against very strong kind of social values I think we have um and moreover, would I think lead to a race to the bottom and the commodification of personal experience and, and people would uh, lose out just as they lose out now. I think more interesting, um, and it's in the same field of conversation, which is how do you empower people with respect to their personal data, are initiatives such as commons, cooperatives. Some people um, talk about something called data trusts, which essentially all have at their heart the idea that individuals will pull, the, pull their data and then jointly govern how it's used and to acting together in a collective will have a stronger negotiating hand when going to the table with a big tech company, for example. Um, and this is also being proposed around um, how we might consider data that's not necessarily individual personal data, but non-personal data or societal data or collective data, which is in fact the property of all of ours and how we can collectively in a participatory way govern how that data is used and benefit collectively as a society. So there are some really interesting ideas that are coming out and we're hoping to see more of those piloted and supported, including by government. I think there's lots of 
like really exciting ways to do it or either at the central government but at, also at the city or local authority level there's different ways in which we could have more kind of collective control and 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 um empowerment over data yeah 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 and um there's quite a few questions in here that relate to data and uh, health i guess hmm. in light of the COVID 19 discussion so tony me has asked um uh, about you know the rollout of telemedicine and remote monitoring and um, so on and so forth. Mm. It gives you the opportunity to reduce pressures on primary and acute care. Mm -hmm. um, but like, what concerns do we have about tracking personal health in such a broad way? Mm. Um, uh, great. Uh, question, Tony. I can point you to some resources straight away. One of which is a report that we wrote last year called "The Data: uh, The Data Will See You Now," which is about the datafication of health, and um, in particular, the datafication of health that's not in the health sector. And it raises lots of these questions that you've uh, you've touched on. The other thing is a project we're about to start working on, which is looking at how the datafication of the health system will impact on health inequalities, which essentially is the way in which people have in the unequal experiences of health and health care. And, um, you know, to take one example, video conferencing um, absolutely will benefit people like ourselves, people who are very confident and literate with technologies, people who speak very good English, um, but might a move to video conferencing um, exclude certain groups such as the digitally excluded who already have worse health outcomes, such as um, people from immigrant communities who would struggle to converse with their doctor in a a remote format so how might the move to technologies actually exacerbate some of those health inequalities or equally how might they assist in them so if certain communities for example suffer from um, obesity more than others might we be able to use wearables and trackers and others to support that so um, we're again starting some research on that soon so Tony I hope you'll follow um, the work that Ada is doing. Fantastic. Um... And um, Charlie Markham asked a related question. Um, how do governments balance data rights and data ethics while still providing an environment where businesses can innovate and create digital tech that benefits the public? Um, maybe it's not an either or. Mm. Um, yeah, I suppose my, my kind of boilerplate answer to that question is absolutely what Chris said, that it shouldn't be an either or, that in order for innovation to be successful, it has to get used and it only gets used by the public if mm -hmm. it's trusted in. And so data gov ethics data governance should be consistent with creating trustworthy technologies that people want to use and, and enjoy using. I think the implication there is that regulation itself is a barrier to innovation. And I think that not only is that a you know, problematic um, starting point. I also don't think the evidence is there to suggest that. I think there's a lot of regulation, for example, in the environmental domain, and we've seen a lot of innovation around environmental um, technologies. So, you know, I think we should be looking at how regulation and ethics can reinforce rather than um, kind of somehow prevent innovation. But I mean, obviously, the devil is in the detail, and 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 it's important that all regulation is responsive to the needs of business and is also to the extent it can be technology neutral so that when technology evolves, the regulation can still apply and doesn't become redundant straight away. Yeah, yeah. And Arik, just coming back to something that um, you mentioned competition and tax and related topics a little bit earlier. Um, one theme in some of the questions is around um, the UK's role in the world now. What's your take on um, you know, both what the UK government has left within its gift to get this right for British companies and also um, related, how much pressure can we realistically put on things which now require international consensus, right, against, like, to act in industries which are, by definition, global? Have we, have we still got some heft in this, do you think? Well, I think waiting, so for example, with um, social media regulation, waiting for there to be sort of global movements on it, or, you know, the UN or some sort of collaborative effort on it, I think is, is quite unrealistic and fraught with so many different problems. So then we have to think about what we can, what we can do domestically. And, you know, the, the UK's online harms legislation is quite a good start, actually, I think. Um, but one thing around tax, you know, France looked at doing a digital services tax. The only real barrier has been the kind of Donald Trump America first response and seeing it as within the context of a trade war. 
And if we can get around that and get the sort of acknowledgement of one country in particular, the US, to acknowledge that these companies do operate in other countries and do operate um, and do have customers in other countries and therefore should be taxed on that basis. I think that's where perhaps Britain's role as, you know, the special special relationship and an ally of the US, that's probably where we should be focusing our attention. Um, because that's the real bottleneck, I think, in, in that aspect. And then once we've solved that, we can then start to think about this sort of societal solutions to some of the problems. So take this information um, or polarization, which is a, inherently is more of an offline issue than it is an, an online one. And you can fund initiatives through attacks on, on these platforms in the same way you would fund um, public health initiatives through attacks on cigarettes or attacks on alcohol or anti-obesity initiatives through attacks on, on junk food. But if we can sort of go back to those more classical policies, I think we would make a lot of progress. And, you know, Britain, I think, could do that role with the US as that kind of applying pressure in that sense. Um, and competition-wise, I think the Competition Markets Authority in the UK has been doing a lot of work around how we can get greater competition amongst tech companies. That I think is probably a much more difficult challenge. But again, it's around the previous question of innovation. Can we make the UK an attractive um, place to to invest and do these sort of startups? What kind of barriers do we need to overcome to make that happen? What kind of skills gaps do we need to fill? Um, what kind of data do we need? All of that. Um, also money investment. Um, so I think there's, there's actually a lot we can do. And that's kind of why I, I saw the, the transition in the US as quite a hopeful possible moment of where we can see that that yeah. change starts to happen. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, OK, I want to change tack slightly. Um, Bruce Clifford asked about um, what place for public education and engagement in growing a more nuanced understanding and use of technology, like in schools and elsewhere. I think, Carly, you mentioned this a little bit around, um, you know, it's a lot to do with um, you know, giving people confidence and the ability to navigate um, this world. Um, and you both think deeply about, you know, these sorts of questions, you know, in the day job, and I'm sure, you know, have um, spent a lot of time on um, these issues to do with, you know, this can't just be the preserve of a handful of tech policy elites, right? It has to become mm -hmm. something that everybody is engaged with. Um, mm. What, um, What's, what do you think are some of the important steps that we need to take together to build this public awareness and engagement? Mm. So I think there's a, there's a kind of macro and micro to that. Um, the macro, I think, is uh, actually another person in the Q&A, David Alexander, referenced this excellent article by Shannon Valor about um, uh, the idea that we would um, borrowed against public trust in the lead up to the pandemic and then that came to bite us essentially and you know one of the questions you asked earlier is who's done this well and undeniably the countries that have done it well places like Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan I mean you might say they have various things in common one thing I think it's clear that they do have in common is high levels of public trust in government um, which has led I think to adherence to rules mm -hmm. um, perhaps in a way that we haven't seen here so how do you build so I think at the macro level there's a how do you build just generally public trust in government um in a country as kind of diverse and dynamic as the United Kingdom that is a major challenge that you know um I think needs to be addressed for all relevant policy areas not only technology and innovation um and then I think there's a micro challenge which is how can you involve people in specific policy debates and specific um um, with respect to specific technological advancements. And there, the Aid Lovelace Institute has been trialing a range of public deliberation methodologies, as have others, of course, um, which we find are really effective in understanding where there's public consensus around really tricky moral issues that arise um, at the intersection of technology and society. So we've just spent this year, or sorry, 2020, working on public engagement in initiatives around biometrics and facial recognition. And we've got a report coming out on that soon. And then we also did a, did a rapid um, public deliberation on contact tracing apps um, at the height of that debate last year. And that was really instructive and very insightful in terms of what are the 
requirements? What are the red lines? What are the kind of thresholds that the public want to see before they will trust trust these types of technologies and use them in the way that the government wants them to use them? So um, I think experience shows that most people can be brought up to expert levels on quite tricky issues of policy, given the time and given the opportunity. And that for the large part, we can come to consensus on really what it might seem like intractable problems. Um, and that just needs to be facilitated in, and space created for that. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that gives me hope is that like there are, I think, really promising technologies to help, as you say, find consensus on things that we mm -hmm. thought were you know, yeah. we descended into enormous unproductive confrontation. Um, Arik, your take on um, public engagement and education? The tech policy? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Harley's work at ALA Lovelace is, you know, I would say is the kind of leader in this space in terms of public engagement. Um, I do still think it's quite a niche subject area. I mean, even on this call, as three, right? I would say we're we have a handful of of, of tech policy people, um, you know, in the UK anyway. And I think a lot of even within the UK or English speaking countries, there's still a lot of group think around lots of different issues. I think it could benefit from a more sort of politically diverse range of views. So, for example, when I started getting interested in tech policy. You know, several years ago, I would say it was quite a libertarian kind of space in the sense that if you go back to um, John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which was a document which basically said the internet is free from governments and mm -hmm. as a new space was all to be kind of free from the, the whims of government regulation, that kind of ideology I think had pervaded most of the, the policy thinking around it and I think that's now slowly starting to change uh, towards being more pro-regulation and more pro-taxation more more in favor of state control um, so I think I think we could benefit from more political diversity and, and, and engagement around um, that policy and, and then just applying some of those lessons we already know from hundreds of years of practice of what works and not see technology as as such a novel or separate entity um you know technology like everything else is is you know part of everyday society a lot of the challenges we're coming across you know again take like polarization or echo mm -hmm. numbers you know, this is not necessarily a new problem around technology we have this problem around the control of uh, legacy media, right? Rupert Murdoch controlling several newspapers for the I mean, for society. And often I think we maybe would benefit from engaging a bit more with our, our own history, engaging a bit more with how we look at other things within society. You know, monopolies, you know, that's, that's an issue we've looked at every every 10 years, right? That yeah, yeah. the issue. And yet we approach it as a, as a sort of novel phenomenon. And yeah. I guess that's the, the, the thing I would change in sort of public engagement or, or stress in public engagement on it. Yeah. And try and get some more of a politically diverse view on that regulation. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic point. And I think, um, you know, that reminder to, um, you know, reflect on our history as well as think about what's new and what's changed is a really, um, really good and salient one. Um, Tom, you can pop the results of the last poll up for people. Um, we don't have time to discuss it now, but um, majority viewers in 2030, the world's largest tech company will be uh, Chinese, not American. Um, I guess we can reconvene uh, for a follow-up event in 2030 and see whether <laughs> we were proved right or not. Um, sadly, we are out of time now and it is good Zoom etiquette to uh, get people away uh, so they can get on with their evening. So look, I'm gonna just wrap us up uh, briefly. Carly and Arik, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us. It's been a real privilege uh, listening to you talk about these really important issues. Um, it's been, I think, a really illuminating uh, conversation from where I've sat. Um, so I'm afraid we haven't had time to answer all the questions that people have put in, but thank you for uh, sharing them. And for the folk who are on the line uh, attending, it's been great to have you uh, with us. Um, just one quick thing to say, which is um, for those of you
who aren't subscribed, um, the Tenure Bear Institute sends out a tech policy newsletter from time to time. You can find it at progress.substack.com. So if you're not signed up, then head there now, pop your email in, and then you'll get regular updates from us and invites to future events. Um, and otherwise, um, look, do stay in touch, reach out if there are things from this conversation that you'd like to talk more about. Um, find Carly and Arik on Twitter and follow them because they're both excellent. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of day. So thank you again for joining us and see you soon.